The seventh vow of universal worthy is to request that the Buddhas remain in the world. The Buddha enters the world, lives in the world, and then enters Nirvana. When the Buddha remains in the world, it is like the sun high in the sky, filling the world with light. When the Buddha enters Nirvana, the sun sets and the world becomes dark. Therefore, universal worthy Bodhisattva made a great vow to ask the Buddhas to remain in the world, to forego answering Nirvana and always remain in the world. Universal Worthy made this, this vow to request that the Buddhas remain in the world because the Buddhas are able to satisfy desires of living beings. If all living beings realized and sincerely asked the Buddhas to dwell here in the world, then the Buddhas would not live to enter Nirvana. If you do not ask the Buddhas to continue dwelling in the world, then as soon as they finish teaching and transforming the living beings, who should receive their instruction, they enter Nirvana. Therefore, the Buddha vowed to request that the Buddhas remain in the world. This is the seventh vow. His eighth vow is to always study the, with the Buddhas. To study with the Buddhas means to study their teachings, the Buddha dramas, of which there are many. In your study, do not be afraid that there are too many Buddha dramas, because the more you study, the more extensive your wisdom will become. For example, why was Ananda's memory so good? The Buddha drama is like a great sea, which flowed into Ananda's mind. It was not that the ocean of drama flowed into his mind, for this is just an analogy, which means that at all time, in life after life, Ananda emphasized learning and studied diligently, and so his memory was very good. So always follow the Buddhas and continually study with them, means that you cannot be like or lazy or madhud, but you must diligently cultivate precepts, samadhi and wisdom, and put your greed, hatred, and stupidity, your three poisons, to rest. If you can do this diligently and cultivate sincerely, perfect in precepts, samadhi, and wisdom, and totally free yourself from all greed, hatred, and stupidity, then you will always study with the Buddhas. The ninth vow, the ninth vow of universal worthy Bodhisattva, is to constantly accord with living beings. His tenth vow is to universally transfer all merit and virtue. Constantly means always, to be forever constant and never change. Accord means to do what is suitable, to respond appropriately to the state of living beings. Doing this may seem to some to pose a problem. Why according to with living beings who are deviant, should one accord with their deviant ways? Basically, living beings are unaware, but if you accord with his lack of awareness, you will end up on the road of stupidity. To accord with living beings means to accord with their customs in order to rescue them from going against the flow. What does this mean? All living beings are topsy-turvy. It is their inverted views and behavior that are called going against the flow. For example, if a stream flows from west to east, but you wish to go up the stream from east to west, you are going against the flow. If you literally accord with living beings, then you will not become a Buddha. And if you want to become a Buddha, then you cannot accord with living beings. Then why does Universal Worthy wish to constantly accord with living beings? Did I not just speak about according with the living beings who are going against the flow until you rescue them? One goes against the flow of common people, involved the six sense objects, and enter the sages flow of the Dharma nature. This is to constantly accord with living beings. When living beings wish to create karma, should you accord with them by creating karma along with them? Does a Bodhisattva who constantly accords with living beings also create karma? 
does he also create offenses among with living beings? Living beings give rise to delusions. They become confused and then they create karma. After they create karma, they undergo the retribution. If you give rise to delusion, create karma and undergo retribution along with living beings, then you are just a living being. You have become a living being. To constantly caught with living beings means to always, without the least feeling of distaste, go along with living beings to teach and transform them and cause them to turn their backs on confusion and return to enlightenment. To leave the confused path and obtain enlightenment. To constantly cause with living beings is also the parameter of Vigo. One who truly cultivates Vigo never has a feeling of distaste for living beings who create offenses. All the living beings create immeasurable offenses. Bodhisattvas do not forsake them. They do not say, you creatures have created so many offenses that I refuse to teach you, and even though some of you will fall into the house, it is none of my business, so go as you wish. Bodhisattvas do not have thoughts like this, but are always compassionate to living beings in spite of their offenses. They are kind and deep to them and take them across. This is truly the parameter of Vigo. Once, when Shakyamuni Buddha was on the causal ground, cultivating the way, cultivating the paramitas of giving and vigil in the mountains, it snowed for many days and everything was covered by a thick white blanket. When a mother tiger and her cubs came out to find something to eat, they could find nothing because of the heavy snow and were about to starve to death. It was then that Shakyamuni Buddha saw them, emaciated and unable to move. He thought, I will give my body to the tigers and tell them to resolve their minds on body, and after they eat me to perfect the unsurpassed path. After he made his vow, he covered his head with his clothes, leapt off a mountain cliff, smashing himself to death in front of the tigers. He gave up his body for three tigers. This is one way to constantly accord with living beings and is an example of Vigo in cultivating the parameter of giving. The Buddha always practices Vigo and giving in this way and thereby constantly accord with living beings. When constantly according with living beings, we should take them across. We should not think universal worthy says to constantly accord with living beings. Now some of them take my confusing drugs, so I think I will too. Some are doing confused things, so I think I will indulge myself along with them. This is not the meaning of constantly according with living beings. To constantly accord with living beings means to pull living beings out of confusion, to pull them along with you on the way to enlightenment. It means to cause living beings to cultivate the way along with you. Do not misunderstand and think that it means to run off and follow the confusion of living beings. Running all over until you lose your way so that you don't know the road back home. This vow reads in Chinese, to constantly caught with living beings. But the translation should read, Living beings constantly accord. Now these are opposite in meaning, but now that I have said that living beings should constantly accord with me on the path to enlightenment, the vow is more in accord with the drama. The tenth vow is to universally transfer all merit and virtue. Universal means infinitely perceive everywhere and totally. To universally transfer all merit and virtue means to always make this transference to whom, to all Buddhas like this. May the merit and virtue accrued from his work adorn the Buddha's pure lands, repaying for kinds of kindness above and aiding those suffering in the three paths below. May those who see and hear of this all bring forth their soul for body. And when this retribution body is prized, may we be reborn together in the land of ultimate bliss. This is what is meant by transferring the merit 
or performing dedications of merit. To transfer means to come back and to go out. It means to come inside and to go outside. After you have to returned, then you can leave. To what place do you return? To the part where you universally transfer all merit and virtue. I want to transfer merit and virtue to all common people, so they become sages. I want to transfer merit and virtue to living beings, so they all become Buddhas. This is universally transferring merit and virtue to return the common to the sagely, to return living beings to Buddhahood, to return all small to the great, and to return oneself to others. Each of these is a way to transfer all merit and virtue. What is the meaning of to return oneself to others? To do something good and transfer all the merit derived from this action to a friend, and thus cause the friend to resolve his mind to attain body and perfect the unsurpassed way is to transfer oneself to others, to transform phenomena to nominon. Whatever you do has a mark, but if you transfer it to nominon, it no longer has a mark because the nominon is without a mark. That is to say, you transfer merit and virtue which has marks and characteristics to the inexhaustible dramarium, the dramarium which can never be exhausted. To so return the small to the great, previously I, re I studied the small vehicle, but now I will study the drama of the great vehicle. This is the meaning of returning the small to the great. The verses above discuss transferring merit and virtue. Every day at the end of the Sutra lecture, we recite these verses. Explaining the Sutras is the practice of giving Dharma, the highest form of giving, and the merit and virtue accrued from this giving is greater than making offerings to the seven precious jewels in all of the three thousand great thousand worlds. Even though the merit and virtue is so great, I do not want to keep it. Then what do you want to do with it? I wish that the merit and virtue accrued by explaining the sutras, speaking the Dharma and turning the great Dharma wheel, will adorn the pure lands of the Buddhas. You should use the merit and virtue which you earn to adorn the pure lands of the Buddhas of the ten directions. Repaying your four kinds of kindness above means to repay heaven and earth, the king, your mother and father, and your teachers and elders, all of whom who are kind ones who nurture one's development. Eating those suffering in the three paths below means to rescue animals, hungry ghosts, and beings in the house. May those who see and hear this, Sutra being lectured, or those who hear this drama, all bring forth the resolve for body. Everyone should quickly resolve to attain body, the path of enlightenment. And when this retribution body expires, our present body is called a retribution body. And when it reaches its end, when it is exhausted and dies, may we be born together in the land of ultimate bliss. All of us together will be born in the land of ultimate bliss. This explanation of transferring merit and virtue describes the tenth vow of universal worthy Bodhisattva as he transfers all the merit and virtue from his deeds to all Buddhas. Sutra Good Wealth Asked Great Sage What does it mean to worship and respect all Buddhas up to and including to universally transfer all merit and virtue? Commentary. The youth guild wealth already understood the ten great vows listed by universal worthy Bodhisattva, but was afraid that all of us living beings had not yet understood them, and so he intentionally asked, What does to worship and respect all Buddhas mean? What does to praise the first come ones mean? What does it mean to extensively cultivate making offerings? How does one repent of karmic obstacles and reform? How does one follow along with and rejoice in merit and virtue and request the turning of the Dharma wheel? How does one request the Buddhas to remain in the world? 
How does one always study with the Buddhas? How does one constantly accord with living beings? And what does it mean to universally transfer all merit and virtue? The youth, good wealth, asked about these vows, saying to universal worthy Bodhisattva, Great Sage, a great sage is a great Bodhisattva, a cultivator with great compassion. Therefore, he asked the great sage, What does it mean to worship and respect all Buddhas, up to and including to universally transfer all merit and virtue? Sutra Universal worthy Bodhisattva told good wealth, good men, to worship and respect all Buddhas is explained like this. All Buddhas, world honored ones, are uh, as numerous as fine modes of dust. In all Buddha lands in the ten directions and the three periods of time, to the exhaustion of the Dharma realm and empty space. Because of the power of universal worthy Bodhisattva's conduct and vows, I have the mind of deep faith and understanding of them as if they were before my eyes. With my body, mouth, and mind karma completely pure, I constantly worship and respect them. Commentary Universal worthy Bodhisattva said to the youth, Good wealth, good men, you are one who cultivates well, and you have asked what it means to worship and respect all Buddhas. Now I will tell you. To worship and respect all Buddhas is explained like this. All Buddhas, world or not ones, are as numerous as fine modes of dust in all Buddha lands in the ten directions and the three periods of time to the, the exhaustion of the Dharma realm and empty space. Exhaustion refers to the ultimate end. When there is nothing left, the Dharma realm and empty space can never cease to exist. And yet, he talks about when the Dharma realm does not exist. The exhaustion of the Dharma realm means the end of empty space which pervades throughout the Dharma realm. Because of the power of universal worthy Bodhisattva's conduct and vows, because I cultivate the practices, practices with exhaust, which exhaust empty space and pervade the Dharma realm. I have a mind of deep faith and understanding of them. I want to use an honest and sincere mind to believe in and understand all Buddhas as if they were before my eyes. When one bows to the Buddhas, one should think, I am before the Buddhas and the Buddhas are before me. There is a verse which everyone should know and contemplate when bowing in great compassion repentance. The worshipper and worshipped in nature are empty and still. The response and the way are intertwined and difficult to conceive of. My Bodhimanda is like the Imperial Pole, Shakyara, Muni, Thus Kama's body manifests in it. My body manifests before Shakyamuni Buddha, bowing down, and I return my life in worship. The worshipped and worshipped in nature are empty and still. The one who is bowing to the Buddha is called the worshipper, and the Buddha receiving the bows is the worshipped. The original nature of both. The worshipper and worshipped is empty and still, and yet that which is empty and still is nonetheless able to respond. And so the next line reads: The response and the way are intertwined and difficult to conceive of. The intertwining of the way and the response is inconceivable. When you bow to the Buddhas, although you are empty, although everything is empty. There is an intertwining of the response with the way. That is why the verse says difficult to conceive of. You cannot conceptualize this state. It is inconceivable. Inconceivable refers to the state beyond words you wish to express it, but you cannot, and the place where the mind functions is destroyed. You may want to have false thought in order to know this state, but you cannot. The mind cannot grasp it. So the verse says, the response and the way are intertwined and difficult to conceive of. My body mind is like the imperial pole, 
His line explains that the bodhimanda in which I bow is like the pearl that chakra has before him in which all forms appear. Shakyamuni thus commands body manifests in it. Shakyamuni Buddha's body appears in the light of the pearl and my body manifests before Shakyamuni Buddha. Bowing down, I return my life in worship. I am before Shakyamuni Buddha with my five extremities touching the ground, bowing to the Buddha with his attitude of mind, which is called the mind of deep faith and understanding. As if they were before my eyes, did I, did I not say earlier that in bowing to the Buddhas, we should realize them as being right before our eyes, and we should realize ourselves as being right before the Buddhas, so that we mutually appear before one another. Confucius said, Sacrifice as if the object of sacrifice were present. Sacrifice to spirits as if they were present, as if they were above or as if they were on both sides. One should sacrifice to spirits as if they were present. When you worship and sacrifice to spirits, you should do so as if they were above you or on your left and right. As if means that you visualize them above and on both sides of you. You should do this when you bow to the Buddhas, as if they were above and as if they were on both sides. If the Buddhas were right in front of you, you would certainly bow to them very respectfully without being the least bit inattentive. To make this point clear, if you we wish to be courteous, courteous to a certain person when we see him, then we may be very respectful while in his presence. But when that person is not around, we allow ourselves to become a little more casual. Here the text puts us face to face with the Buddhas, with my body, mouth and mind, karma, completely pure. Completely means totally, with also means to use. And so the text can also mean to use pure body, mouth, and mind karma in all that you think, say, and do. You cannot commit the ten evil acts and then bow to the Buddhas thinking that you can balance off the karma in that way. It would not work, and so you must be pure in your karma of body, mouth, and mind. As I have explained before, the body can commit three kinds of evil deeds killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. You cannot go out and kill something and then think, this killing was an offense, so I will go to a temple to bow and repent of it. You do not ordinarily bow to the Buddhas when you have not killed, but as soon as you kill, you wash your, the blood off your hands and run to the temple to repent. This is an example of impure body karma. Furthermore, you cannot steal valuables, th valuables and think, I have stolen and this has broken the second precept against stealing. I had better go quickly before the Buddhas to bow and repent. This repentance is impure action. Whether you are a man or a woman, if you are promiscuous and then think, Oh, I have used my body incorrectly. I should go quickly to bow to the Buddhas, and there you repent. This too is to be impure in body, speech, and mind while bowing to the Buddhas. You must not kill, steal, and commit sexual misconduct. And then, when you bow to the Buddhas, there will be a response. The mind can commit uh, three kinds of evil offenses greed, hatred, and stupidity. I often talk about a mind and a heart which are greedy. Why are we so hurried and flustered? Why is it that we never rest all day long? It is because of our greed, hankering after this and that, covetous, covetous, and lustful, your greed stirs you up so you can never rest. Following greed is there is a mind and heart which are filled with hatred. If you desire something and you do not get it, if things do not go your way and you want them to, then you become afflicted with anger. 
Why do people become afflicted? It is stupidity which allows afflictions to arise. It is because you are so stupid that you can become afflicted. Those who are wise do not become afflicted no matter what difficulties they encounter, even if things do not agree with their wishes. Stupid people are at the same time the funniest and the most pitiful. How stupid can people be? There might be one who has not gone to elementary school or high school or college who meets a person with PhD. He notices that most people address the PhD as doctor so and so, praising him in this way, envious of the PhD's special status. He also wants the same degree, but if he does not go to school, who will give him a PhD? No one.